Hey, we've got a special episode of the podcast today because this is an exciting week. After months of hard work, our small team of four people here is launching our new podcast series that's in addition to the Real Time Analytics Podcast. It's called Keyboard and Quill. It's a serial, narrative, highly produced podcast exploring the history of real-time analytics, starting with cave paintings and going through smartphones and Kafka and Pino, really the whole thing. The first episode launches Tuesday, March 12th. You can subscribe on all the major podcast platforms, or you can just go to stree.ai slash keyboard and quill, and that link is in the show notes below. So as a part of the research behind the story that we're telling in Keyboard and Quill, we captured some fascinating interviews, but because of the format of that podcast, we could only include little snippets in specific episodes. But I thought it'd be great if we could share some of our favorite interviews here on the Real Time Analytics podcast, the ones that are most applicable. So on today's episode, I'm talking to Professor Lane Nooney about their book, The Apple II Age, how the computer became personal, and how they view the impact of computer development as it connects to the quickening pace of life. And that's one of the topics we cover in Keyboard and Quill. And the emergence of personal computers is, we think, uh, a part of that. And you know, it's kind of just a fun story. If you're the kind of person who cares about real-time analytics, you probably care about that story too. So Lane is a computer and video game historian and a professor in the storied media studies department at NYU, kind of a big deal. So I really hope you enjoy this episode. And one more thing, Keyboard and Quill is sponsored by the Real-Time Analytics Summit coming up soon, May 7th through 9th of 2024. Go to rtasummit.com and type in rtapod30, that's rtapod30, when you register for 30% off just for being a listener here. Thanks a lot. Now let's listen in to my conversation with Lane. Yeah, I think you've got, I imagine, some really cool stories to tell, zooming in on, you know, the development of the personal computer, the early days, Apple II stuff. I mean, that's that's super pivotal. The way I see that history as a non-professional historian, I mean, not a historian, like not a professional, but person who is in this space and was alive at the time, even if I wasn't super keyed into Apple II stuff, like that's the pivot from this is really a hardcore hobby that that insiders are doing. Like today, we would call them hardware hackers. And, and you start to pivot from, no, it's a thing you can have at home and do stuff with. And I think that story is very interesting. And I just want to turn it over to you. That 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 story of the computer becoming personal, how how do you see that? And I'd love to hear your, your thoughts there. Yeah, so... You know, this is sort of the story that my book, The Apple II Age, How the Computer Became Personal, sets out to track. And, you know, as another podcast interviewer uh, described it, the Apple II is a little bit of a MacGuffin in the book because the goal of the book is really to explain how software is is what kind of drives a lot of the the expansion of the idea of of why would you even want a computer in your home right so i think the, i think the history that you just charted out is a really commonly assumed one especially among tech professionals we have this idea that in sometime in the 1970s maybe the early 1980s everyone realized that computers were viable for the home and we should get them and that 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 this was a massive transformation in uh you know, domestic technology use, people's familiarity with the computing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and a big part of the goal of the book was to really to complicate our assumption that that transition was obvious, essential, or easy. And uh, one of the ways I do that is, is, you know, the personal computer actually did not achieve anywhere close to, you know, to what we could describe as ubiquity, basically, in in the domestic in the domestic context until the 21st century, right? Uh, for most of the 1980s, you're barely out of double digit installed base. Even in the 1990s, you have maybe one third of American homes uh, with a personal computer, right? In the in the early to mid 90s, and the 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 th so it's sort of like the opposite was true that personal computers for the most part people could not 
really struggled to find justifications for why they needed to own them. I think that studying the history of software allows us to understand what those justifications were, who they were targeted to, what actual use practices were. I'm really interested in following this idea of like you follow the software because it tells you what people did with their computers, not just that they had one and, and, and user experiences and, and, and goals are, are really diverse. Let me, um, if, if I could sure. some completely unscientific history, which is me remembering things. Uh, <laughs> um, it, we, we, the family I grew up in, we were definitely weird in that we had, computers. We had, it was 1982. My dad got a non PC compatible, uh, DOS machine, which was just bizarre. Right. But to have a computer then was kind of like a consumption good in itself. You just, you wanted it because it was the thing that it was. And I, I was a nerdy teenager and it was, nobody ever needed to explain to me why it was a good idea. It just was like, I just, this is what I want to do. What do you do with it? Well, you know, and especially as like internet users now trying to explain to people what you did with disconnected computers besides play games on them. You really, I, I sometimes feel like I have to kind of grasp for things. Uh, so it, I, I, I get that even on a personal level, my own experience in that transition, it was like, well, no, you just, you just did. And it was fun. Uh, but that, that by itself is a recipe for uh, not very much market penetration. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think one of the the things that I discovered the more I dug into it is that the, the personal computer really, you know, that, that, how old were you when the Apple II came out? I, okay, okay, when did the Apple II come out? Was it 79? Uh, 77, it really achieved, it's, you get the Apple IIe in 79, that's really when it becomes okay. like viable. I was, I was or sorry, born the seven, Apple II Plus, whatever, you know. Yeah, I was born in uh, 72, so I was five. Okay, yeah. So probably a lot of the larger, let's say, um, political, economic, and geopolitical currents that were going on at that time were not really visible to you as a child, right? I, and, I and, was a nerdy kid, but, you know, maybe not quite that nerdy. So yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, there's... And, and so um, one of the things I, I, I have... I'm really strongly considered is that, you know, the personal, the idea of a, a home microcomputer really emerges in the late 1970s. And one of the reasons it, it, it sort of catalyzes this idea that there's going to be a revolution around it is because America in the 1970s was really having a hard time, right? So, you know, when America had come out of World War II, there's this tremendous post-war boom, productivity skyrockets, right? Standard of living goes up. And in the 1970s, a lot of those gains begin to backslide. So you have unprecedented inflation, unemployment, you have the, the loss of the gold standard. There's an oil crisis that's causing panic buying and rationing of oil, right? America is for the first time kind of ceasing to see itself as in control of the global picture right and the question is if 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 industry right if kind of manufacturing is not what we do right um or that is no longer what we are the global leader of what's next and there was this this kind of big open space, I think, for the for answering that question. And some of the venture capitalists in Silicon Valley really thought the personal computer could be an answer to the what's next, right? So a lot of the marketing attention, mainstream news attention, uh, a lot of the ways that computers were positioned as efficiency machines um, had to do... Also, a lot of the reasons that parents were interested in having in their children having access to a computer was because of this kind of Japanophobia about uh, economic competition between the United States and Japan. And there was this idea that simply allowing your child to have exposure to a computer, regardless of whether they did anything educational with it, was in and of itself pedagogic. Because so, then they would quote unquote know computers. Yeah, that they would be is... familiar with them. They and and there's 
Yeah, you know, in the same way that sitting your kid in front of a television, I guess, makes them familiar with TV, but it doesn't mean they know anything about how it operates. Uh, right. Although, of course, at this time, in order to function a computer, you had to you had to still kind of have some operating knowledge of how the thing worked, at least to a minimum. You know, when we're talking about a pre-graphical user interface era, mm-hmm. um, but yeah. So and 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 the the. The interest that so the, so the financial investment that winds up floating and scaffolding all of this manufacturing and personal computing, right, and all of this distribution and commercialism, is really buoyed by these particular financial interests. This is one of the cases my books make sort of over and over again is that the personal computer required what I call a series of iterative justifications for why it even needed to exist. It had to keep telling you why it was important, which is usually one of the cues that something doesn't need to exist. That this is not like, you know, innovation unhinged from any other type, you know, any other sort of like social factor, right? There are people who put money into this and they want a return. There was a number of changes in financial law that loosened up capital for venture capital investing that made additional capital available to invest into what was considered these high risk technology industries. And that included people's pensions, right? So changes in the capital gains tax made it uh, less risky for venture capitalists to uh, try and invest in stuff that might fail, right? And, okay. and, and, so, and so that winds up a bunch of money gets loose, right, in the late 70s and again in the early 80s under the Reagan administration. And all of that helps buoy and expand this, this industry that actually struggles I would say to have much market penetration for the first decade of its of its life, right? The computer is not television. Television went from zero to eighty percent in the span of a decade. The smartphone was to, even faster. You didn't have to explain it to anybody ever. And it and just, it was yeah, it was it, it was it was a pretty you know there was still a period of social acclimation that had to happen, but the use cases for the computer, especially if you did not run a small business. Yeah. Why you would own a personal computer was a little unclear, except for this general sense that I would say the media, uh, biz- and this includes everything from like you know business writing to to newspaper reporting to um, uh, you know uh, news specials, really did punctuate this sense that like having a computer was part of being prepared for this thing that nobody understood but was going to be the sort of information age right or the the kind of third wave in the in the words of Alvin Toffler who is a very very prominent and widely read futurist of the time who believed that there was going to be we were going to live in an information society that was going to kind of like restructure how all of our uh, you know, social, economic, and and political experiences happened. Okay, so you were you were talking about software being the really interesting thing. I mean, there's there's ventures being started. Some of them are, you know, Silicon Valley super risky things. Some of them are, you know, IBM and the stuff they're doing in Boca Raton and all that. And and uh, you know, but what people people are making big bets on the hardware. But you were talking about the software. I think you. You kind of hinted that you think the software is really the key. Yeah, the software is without the software, there is no justification for using or owning a, a computer, right? And so I, th- I think that a lot of our stories and histories of the compu- of the personal computing era have really, t- especially um, kind of in enthusiast writing and, and writing you see on the web, really expresses a sort of hardware fetish that that there's this interest in all of the specs, all of the data, you know, what did the, what was the machine, why the machine was so important. And it's like the machine is only as good as the software that was made for it. And this is where the Apple story, I think, gets really interesting because, you know, it had a set of kind of technological capacities that made it really ambidextrous in the market. It's particularly that it's, it was like immediately expandable in mm-hmm. ways that the other, its other competing systems, particularly the TRS-80 and the Commodore PET, were not, uh, but also the way that it treated third-party developers. 
um, that it didn't try to lock them into any sort of proprietary relationship with Apple. You know, if you if you were a third party developer for the Radio Shack computer, um, you couldn't sell your software in their stores without entering into a, a licensing arrangement with Radio Shack, right? Uh-huh. And that cut down. So actually, the 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 TRS-80 was the best-selling microcomputer of the late 70s. But that speak that sharp uptick begins to bend downward as what happens is that selling third-party software gets harder and harder and harder, right? Because these these programmers realize they're getting screwed. They if they want to sell their stuff, they can't do it. They can't do it through Radio Shack stores. And they they have to you know, individually advertise. It's just not. It's just not conducive to producing the, a sort of vast market, right? But the Apple, right. because one, you could. It was immediately expandable up to forty eight k from the moment it was produced. Would would that have been inordinately expensive? Yes, but mm-hmm. that was also what allowed something like VisiCalc to be designed. Right, is that the other two machines just didn't have the specs to be able to handle a piece of software of that complexity. Um, you either had to buy kind of new versions or extra peripherals in addition to the to the to the memory upgrades. And and so Apple really it begins to go up right at that moment that kind of the TRS eighty is is going down a bit. And by the by, let's say, 84, when Print Shop comes out, I have a whole chapter in my book about the print shop. By, by 84, the reason the Apple is still a, a strong selling computer is not because of the system specs anymore, but it's because it has the largest library of third party software on the market. There's okay. more like so if you want to buy the system that is likely to have the kind of software you need you buy an Apple. And so what you're paying for is no longer, you know, it wasn't exactly a great deal in terms of the the bones of the specs that you were getting. But what was a great deal was it was the entryway to all of the software you could possibly require. Yep. And, and so there are these kind of larger economic factors kind of moving. You really have to, I use the word in my book a lot, ecology. And I, I, I like yes. that word because you have to think of these things as as operating within systems, right? It's not that there's like one feature or one quality that causes something to rise above the other. It's like you have to kind of put all the, you know, you have all of these different computers on the board and then you have the passage of time and then you have the way that software developers are interacting with them and it's all quite in flux at every single moment. And so how like one thing winds up emerging as the dominant um, you know, the one of the dominant computing systems of the era is is quite complex, right? And it's not reducible just to the technological qualities of any specific system, right? Uh, um, yeah, that's so, so true. Uh, again, I, I spent the 80s with kind of non-standard systems. We had this, uh, you know, DOS machine that was not PC compatible, but it was better because the specs. <laughs> Let me tell you, no, listen, where are you going? You know, that's... <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, as a teenager, I bought an Amiga 500, which again, you know, stop, come back. I'll explain to you why it's really Yeah, bad. yeah, yeah, yeah. And you bought you bought the system that had, you know, you bought the hot rod of systems and it turns out nobody cared, right? Nobody it's, it's, Nobody cared. cared. And, um, and the funny thing is that has impacted my, the, the, the way I select and think about and, and choose that technology, you know, over my career. Yeah, I had, you know, my first computer I got in, I think, 1990, 1991. And it was a, it was a, um, it was a, it was like the first, it was one of the first gen Tandys, you know, it was a computer that was already like, five or six years out of date, you know, in the early nineties, I had a five and a quarter floppy drive and, 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 you know, which is quite out of date. If you were following the cutting edge of the technology as it was being developed in the 1980s. But the fact is as a child, I didn't know that, you know, I wasn't hanging out with other people who had computers and so the fact that I was kind of always five years behind the computing curve actually has taught me a lot about what 
regular users are like, which is uh-huh. that like the vast majority of people who own these technologies were not keeping up with all the latest tech. They were not necessarily interested in like, you know, cherrying out their systems. A lot of people got a computer. They maybe they needed it to do one or two things. And that was what they did with it for sometimes decades, mm-hmm. right? That is what real users are like, right? They are not like on the cutting edge, right? We're we like real users are they're hacky, they duct tape and staple stuff together, they endure, you know, like weird preferences because that's just like what they know. And it's a it's a really kind of um it's an idea of like kind of vernacular computing, right? This this is this is comp- a kind of folk culture almost around what computing yeah. is like. And, oh, I, and I think reorienting our history to realizing that not everyone is interested in computing for the pursuit of this technological edge, I think actually helps us understand like what real users are made of and why people are drawn to these technologies to begin with. That is fascinating. And <laughs> I'm just I'm just taking it in for the first time here because everybody else, they're just trying to solve problems. They're just they're just getting by, doing their thing. And uh, that history of the common person's computing uh, is is clearly important. Uh, and it, it like like you said, it isn't until people start figuring out how to solve problems with computers like that that in, which is the story of software that this actually becomes an important thing and not just a thing we do for its own sake. Yeah, I mean, there's no one constituency that owns what computer history means. No. And I think that w- by and large, up until very recently, computer history has traditionally been written by folks who have a really personal sense of investment in that history and who, yeah, per, you know, whose sense of identity is really forged by that history. And there's a lot of value that comes with that, but there's also some downsides, which is that it tends to see itself everywhere, right? Or it, it kind of can't quite imagine or doesn't know how to v- look for the the other kinds of histories that were around these objects for people who did not make them the center of their identity. Uh-huh. And in many cases, that was the far larger proportion of people. That was oh, yes. the far larger category of use. And, and what I'm Try, try to do in you know my book and a wide variety of my other work is is look at these kind of you know is to give some recognition to you know what I sort of call like like history for everybody else right like a history that you might see your that that someone who is not a technical expert might actually see themselves in um, because currently I think those histories don't really exist you know right. and which is why tech history remains and I think kind of tends to perpetuate itself as this kind of very niche kind of interest when actually there's there's so much to learn here and so much we should be attentive to. But it's hard to get people in when when it constructs the reader as if you are one of them. Yeah, yeah. Boy, that's important. I'm going to be thinking about that for a little bit. So we're talking about the, the client server revolution and computers yeah. coming to the desktop and the computer as creative tool was, I mean, that was Apple's whole story. And I'm, I'm going by my memory. So yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, correct me, but um, it's this thing that, that opens up whole new vistas and you can do things you never could have. And their software, I, I would say back that claim. I mean, that's, that's where they were going. That's the kind of stuff that they, they cultivated in their ecosystem and that's what they're known for. And that wasn't most business users. Um, most people have, and like, look at, look at life now in a typical corporate setting. You got Google Sheets, you got Google Docs, and you got email. And, you but know, you don't you, have Google Paint, you know, like. You don't have Google <laughs> Paint, now do you? You got Figma, if, if that touches your life at all. And I occasionally open Figma Docs to look at things that a designer has done to not have any useful thoughts on. Um, Cause it's just not my thing, but um I mean, that's 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 what has I mean that's way later, but that penetration into the you know computing on the desktop in the yeah. business. Yeah, I mean I you know I don't I, I'm not as well versed in the sort of uh, business and that arc of the business and technological history, but it's without doubt that 
Apple manages to really position itself well to take over a lot of the computing kind of requirements of the technology industries, at least in a sort of maybe like mainstream uh, biz- business sense, right? You know, they're, 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 that critical work with like, you know, PostScript and the Adobe suite and the, the, um, I'm thinking of who made PageMaker, uh, you Aldous. know, Aldis, Cork Express, all of that stuff, right? That, that at that time would only run on, on a, on an Apple machine. But again, that's, a, that's an interesting kind of like almost, like highbrow history. And I teach a big history of media class uh, at NYU. We basically go from like the invention of fire to Google ad search in the span of one semester. And I have a whole class day that I've dedicated um, to actually MS Paint and how critical MS Paint was to the development of like an internet art vernacular right yes. that all meme culture yes. basically yes. where does meme culture come from it comes from ms paint there's a great Freaking article by by a guy i was named, there by, by a guy named patrick davison he um he writes uh, i think it's called because of the pixels is the is the name of the article but he he basically does a kind of media archaeology of how ms paint became the thing that it is and and this is an example where this kind of weird vestigial tale of a paint tool sticks around as almost like software that they forgot about, you know, that they, they just kept, you know, Microsoft just kept shoveling it back into the OS until it comes out in Windows 95. And this happens to be the same suite of software that winds up, uh, you know, Windows 95 becomes the most used operating system in the world. So you've got people all around the globe, right, using MS Paint. You want to make an image and put it on the internet, you make it in MS Paint. And it's a, it's a kind of, it's, it's like talk about having like no idea what you're doing or making at the bitmap level. Right. But like so many people were fascinated. I did that as a kid. I zoomed all the way into, you could see the grid and then you would just color it in pixel by pixel and make Uh little images. Um, And, and so again, there's this interesting counterpoint to the, the sort of, you know, the Apple story of kind of highbrow creativity and what the average user is sort of getting their hands on. You know, I remember we couldn't afford uh, any of the Adobe suite. So we stuck around with some sort of free version of Corel Draw, there I believe go. was what we had, you know? Corel uh, in the early 90s, I, that was yeah. my first vector drawing program. And yeah. I, I, yeah. I, I, dang it, I, I could drive Corel back in the day. <laughs> I could make that thing do things. Yeah, like, I mean, set me down with Adobe Illustrator, and it's not really quite as nice to watch it. I'm happen. I'm dying for the for the the books on this stuff. You know, the the histories. Yeah. The the '90s moment is so hard because so much of that documentation kind of started to go online. It's not as well documented as the stuff from the 1980s because so much of that was periodical based that it has wound up being saved. But, you know, once you get into like macromedia, once you get into the CD-ROM moment, a lot of the, let's say the, pro- what we would call the primary documents that historians need to do their work are oh. kind of much harder to trace or locate. Yeah, for you as a historian, you know? people yeah. are writing stuff and putting it on the web and then 10 years later, oh, it's, it's gone it's, now. Yeah, it's like somebody's GeoCities page is, you know, oh. what am I going to, what am I going to do with this? And so it's a, it's a really different the funny thing about computing as it speeds up is that, you know, I think it, it, historians have to develop a lot of capacity in dealing with these different kind of eras for where primary documents went and the kinds of ways that they were saved, uh, reproduced, you know, um, yeah. and, and you, incre- you increasingly deal with a fragmented archive. I mean, my own work, I rarely deal with singular archives and, and I pull from stuff all over the internet and from material collections, but it only gets worse the farther forward in time we get. And and you think about how you do business history of a tech corporation today, when all of your internal document, like where do you do your business? Probably in a Slack or in yeah. a bunch of Google Docs or, right. you know, in right. proprietary third-party systems that like, what historian is going to be able to get their hands on that in 50 yeah. years? Nobody. You know? oh. um, very different from IBM, HP, 
you know, these kind of classic titans of the 20th century that have corporate archives, you know? Right. Paper. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> As so the web happens and I'm, I'm going to suggest that that is now a compelling reason. So it was for hobbyists and, and true believers in the eighties, but now it's like, okay, you know, this, there's, there's really a reason. Um, and, and you see the penetration follow suit. Yeah. yeah. What, so, you know, I guess, correct me if I'm wrong on that, number one. And what do you think that does to the pace of life? You, you said something about computers getting faster. And is, is there, now that it's, it's becoming more ubiquitous, is that driving us in some way? Is that changing the way we live life? Yeah, so I think it's indisputable that the premise of the internet provided a rationale for personal computer ownership that in some cases the personal computer itself had not adequately supplied, right? Nothing amazing happens in the world of personal computing between 1977 and let's say 1992, you know, or whenever kind of AOL becomes a bit more mainstream, right? Like obviously things happened, but there was no dramatic change in the technology. It gets more, you know, memory gets it bigger. It hurts, things, but I, I don't know how to disagree. Get, things get faster, Right. You know, images can get more indexical to real life, but there's no real transformation in, in what you're doing. Right. Yeah. But the Internet, I, you know, the Internet felt like magic. I remember I was shown the Internet. I was shown AOL in a school, in a classroom. Uh, and and it was wild that as a child, somehow you were just like, oh, OK. So I talked to people who weren't here. Like, like why that made sense is a bit, you know, mystifying, yeah, yeah. but you just kind of accept it and you're like, okie dokie, you know, they're on a computer too. I'm on a computer. We're going to chat. The question of the, the speed of life is a really complex one, right? Because it gets into sort of anthropology, sociology, media theory, right? It, it, it's a, do, it's a, it's, is it a, it's about like, do we believe in technological determinism or not, right? Mm. Do media drive our social lives or is there a, a more kind of, and I think I tend to fall on the side of there's a more co-productive set of relationships. Yeah. I think a lot of these technologies get designed for acceleration because that ultimately benefits profit motive, right? It like, like they, they want to increase levels of engagement. They want to increase levels of stickiness. They want to increase levels of attraction because their goal is to keep you in that kind of, you know, in AOL's case, that walled garden for as long as possible, charging you minute by minute by minute by minute. Right. Um, and so there's, there's speed, which is one thing, but there's also like attention, which is which is another, right? And and this is before we even get into the mess that is our current kind of datafied society, where like everything is basically paid for by our attention, right? Like everything on the internet is 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 bracketed between two advertisements, right? Yeah, I don't know if it's speed as much as I think it's like the the kind of the mind shift that comes with everything get, got both bigger and smaller, right? Uh -huh. It's that like my ability to talk to someone who lived very, very far away became instantaneous and immediate. The time shrank to zero. Space shrank to right? zero. There is yeah. no space. Yeah. And, but also the amount of things that I could suddenly know about and know about immediately grew infinitely, right? But also like, do we discover that it is fun? To, to hang out and talk to these people, yes. But then the systems kind of take that and, and kind of opportunistically um, leverage it toward and accelerate it toward a kind of capital gain, right? If that makes sense, like, there you, go. you know, yeah. Uh, you've talked about a couple of classes of yours that I would love to take, but um, no, this is, this, Lane, this has been wonderful. Thank you so much. No problem. And there you have it. If you feel compelled to help us spread the word and grow the real-time analytics community, you can give us a rating on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or wherever fine podcasts are sold. If you're watching us on YouTube, hey, subscribe and, of course, hit that notification bell. And you can always share your favorite episodes on LinkedIn or Twitter or wherever it is you do social media. Thanks, and I look forward to talking to you in the next episode.